Today's lecture is going to be on first differencing IV methods or instrumental variable methods and the generalized method of moments approach to estimation. This lecture concludes our sequence of lectures for the linear unobserved effects model for panel data. Last time we discussed estimation under weaker assumptions showing that the fixed effects and first differences estimators were generally inconsistent under the assumption of sequential exogeneity or predeterminedness of the regressors. Today we'll talk about how to exploit instrumental variables arising from sequential exogeneity in order to recover consistency in some cases. Next time we'll then move on to talking about estimation methods for nonlinear models. So we still consider the linear model, linear unobserved effects model for panel data. And as last time, uh, we continue to assume, like we did last lecture, that the regressors are not necessarily strictly exogenous, but they are sequentially exogenous. By sequential exogeneity of the regressors or predeterminedness of the regressors, we mean that upon conditioning on the individual effect and regressors in both the current and all past time periods, the idiosyncratic errors have conditional mean zero. Now, since we still have to deal with this individual effect, we'll calculate differences in order to eliminate it, thus arriving at this linear equation system, which is linear in the parameters, but also in which is linear in the parameters and involves the differences in our original variables. Last time we showed that in this model, viewing the difference system as our estimating equations, we, ha we still have a problem to solve in that the regressors which appear here, which are the differences in our original regressors, are endogenous. That is, they are endogenous in the sense of correlating with the differences of, in the idiosyncratic errors, which under our assumption of sequential exogeneity involves this latter term. The problem here is that upon differencing, we're introducing a product between the current period's regressors and the idiosyncratic errors from one period into the past. Now, since our assumption of sequential exogeneity does not in any shape or form restrict the relationship between these two variables, we cannot expect the mean between the two or the mean of their product to be zero in general. However, we showed that our assumption of sequential exogeneity immediately suggests inter instrumental variables for this endogenous regressor or the vector of endogenous regressors. Namely, the valid instruments at time t that is, these are instruments for the difference to regressors. It's given by this long list, potentially long list of variables, which involves the regressors from all periods into the past. That is, regressors from the first, second, third, and so forth, all the way up to period t minus 1. We introduced notation for this potentially long vector by using this superscript O, with OIT or XIT with an O on top denotes the list of XITs from all periods up to and including the time period subscript. So when we're dealing with XIT minus one O, we have a vector of length T minus one K. Let's look back at a concrete example, again illustrating these findings 
in the context of our first order autoregressive model. Here I'm repeating the first, our first order autoregressive model for convenience, where we're modeling the current outcome as a linear function in the lagged dependent variable, the lagged outcome, up to unobservable, uh, up to unobservables, including an individual effect. Now our assumption of sequential exogeneity, since the current regressors is just given by the scalar, which is the lag dependent variable, our assumption of sequential exogeneity amounts to assuming that conditional on the individual effect and all outcomes in the past, the current idiosyncratic error has mean zero. And this should hold for all time periods. Again, we'll difference the system to rid ourselves of the individual effect in the process, losing one period of data. Hence, the T subscript starts at time equals two. Now, since there are our regressors are, is given by the scalar, the lag dependent variable, the problematic or endogenous regressor in our estimating equation given by this different system it's just the difference in the lag dependent variables. Hence, when we're looking at the instruments available to us at time t, we're looking at the regressors from all periods into the past, which in this case amounts to the outcomes at least two periods into the past, which we may by using the same type of notation, denote yit minus 2 with a superscript o. Having instruments at our disposal, we may consider proceeding taking an instrumental variables approach to estimation of the first order autoregressive model. In general, having at for individual i at time t instrument an instrument ZIT, which is in this case just scalar, the pooled instrumental variables estimator is given by this formula, where ZIT acts as an instrument for the difference in the lag dependent variable. Now this is the pooled IV estimator since we are aggregating over both individuals and time. Here I've deliberately not specify the range of summation over time, since it hinges on our choice of instrument. For example, using that the twice lagged dependent variable is in our set of instruments, which is given by all outcomes at least two periods into the past, we could consider a pooled IV estimator using this as our single instrument. In that case, we end up with an estimator taking this form. Now, since we, we're using the, lag, the, the twice lagged dependent variable, we may use all data starting from the initial outcome, which was yi zero. Hence, our range of summation over time starts at two. Now looking at this formula, one might find it a bit strange that we're instrumenting, or we're using as an instrument for a difference variable, a variable in levels. And one might find it more natural to use a also a differenced instrument or an instrument which appears in differences. Now, since also outcomes further into the past are part of our available instruments. We may use as an instrument the, the lagged depend, the twice lagged dependent variable. That's a difference in the twice lagged dependent variable, which is given by this expression. Well, in this case, our formula for the pooled IV estimator looks something like this. 
but since we're including variables which are three periods into the future, our range of summation over time has to start at t equals to three. Now one may show using our previous tools for analyzing estimators that both of these pooled IV estimators will be consistent as well as asymptotically normal. But in these estimators, we only use part of the instruments available to us at any given point. So one may ask, or what might be tempted to ask, well, how would we use more instrumental variables knowing that more are available? And also, how could we combine these instruments in an attempt to achieve efficiency? So that's what we'll do next. So for the remainder of this video, we'll take a closer look at the first differencing instrumental variable methods for estimating these types of models, as well as the, the method of generalized method of moments. We'll start out by talking about the generalized method of moments, specifically in the context of our differenced equation system. Now the particular implementation of GMM or generalized method of moments depends on the choice of weighting matrix and we'll discuss the different choices thereof. One leading us to the efficient GMM estimator. Then we'll talk about inference through both variance estimation as well as a test of over identification or over identifying restrictions, which will allow us to test the validity of our instruments. Then we'll discuss more issues which arises in more general dynamic models. Lastly, I'll round off our sequence of lectures concerning the linear panel data model by summarizing our lectures. First up, first differencing IV methods and GMM. So we now return to our system or equation system written in first differences and stack these equations or capital T minus one equations into a linear system as written here. Now here I'm using these bold phase notation of for the delta y's as the vector, the t, t minus one vector, which arises from stacking the different outcomes over time. Similarly, I've stacked the regressors over time in order to arrive at a matrix of dimensions t minus one by k. Now viewing these equations in differences as a system highlights that what we're searching for is a method for instrumenting our regressors in the system, which would be this delta boldface xi, or perhaps another way to view it, view it is that is to look at it as a search for instruments for the various rows of this matrix. Now, given our assumption of sequential exogeneity, we know what instruments are available to us at any point in time. So here we're gonna gather all of these valid instruments into a potentially large matrix, which we'll call our instrument matrix. Our notation for this matrix will be the, the matrix of instruments available to us for individual I will be this capital both phase ZI. <laughs> now this matrix is a seemingly diagonal matrix where we've put the, the instruments available to us along the diagonal. For example, now this matrix, I should say, has T minus one rows corresponding to the number of equations in our system. For example, at our first point in time or the first equation, which we know occurs at time equals two, the instruments available to us are the regressors in the past, which is just given by the regressors from period one, which coincides with xi one o. Our second equation, which occurs at time three, 
tells us that or oh, at a, at time equals is three the instruments available to us are given by the regressors in the past which are xi1 and xi2 which we here have abbreviated xi20 proceeding in the same manner for all periods of time all the way up to the last which is at capital t we see here at the last period that we have as available to us uh, as valid instruments at time capital t all the periods running from period one all the way through the penultimate period now the total number of instruments corresponding to the number of columns in our instrument matrix we abbreviate by l and it is t minus one times t times k halves why this number specifically you may ask well it comes from add, adding up all of the available instruments over time or over the number of of equations that we're we're looking at so at the first equation we have the regressors in the first period our first equation which occurs at time equals to two we have as instruments the regressors from the first period and there are k of those at time equals to three the number of instruments available to us are the regressors in periods one and two so there are two k of those and proceeding in this manner we see that all the way up to our last equation occurring at capital t where we have t minus one by k regressors which we, which could act as instruments in this period factoring out k we may write this total number of instruments as k times the sum of time running from one all the way through capital t minus one now we invoke a simple rule for summation stating that if we sum the integers running from one all the way through to some capital m say then it's simply m times n minus one whoops plus one halves in our case m is capital t minus one although i mentioned that the instrument matrix has a diagonal like look to it the way i typed it up here at least suggests that it's a diagonal matrix looks can be deceiving the reason the reason why this is in fact not a diagonal matrix is that the number of instruments available to us will change with the point in time hence the dimension of this first vector and the dimension of this second vector will not be the same i've tried to stress the the non-diagonality of this matrix by adding subscripts to the zeros highlighting what type of vector of zeros i'm talking about now at this point it may be helpful to illustrate this type of instrument matrix in a simple setting such as our first order order regressive model so recall that in the first order order regressive model there's just a single regressor given by the lag dependent variable so k is equal to one at time equals to two we only have a single instrument available to us given by the outcome two periods into the past which is y i zero at time equal to three we have going at least two periods back we have two instruments available to us namely y i zero and y i one similarly for the fourth time period or third equation we have three outcomes which could act as instruments and at the last equation or at time t equals to capital t we have all outcomes at least two periods further into the further back in time so in this case the number of instruments is capital t minus one t halves. 
Now, a possible source of confusion is that in constructing this matrix, I'm treating the outcome as observed. However, when you open your data set, there's no, say, row zero available. However, you may always proceed by redefining or relabeling the time subscript, which amounts to swapping our current capital T for capital T plus one, and then relabeling all variables. In that case, we would simply start this matrix at yi1. You'll get practice with this during the exercises. Next, we'll move on to talking about how we may use these instruments in a generalized methods of moments approach. So by construction, construction of our instrument matrix, when we interact the instrument matrix with our vector of different idiosyncratic errors, we get a, an L by one vector, which has mean zero. Again, this, this result or this expression relies on our assumption of sequential exogeneity. Now, under a rank condition, that is a condition restricting the relationship between the instruments and our difference regressors, one may show that the underlying parameters beta uniquely solve the following linear equation system, which is a system with unknown being this vector boldface B. Now this identification type of result, we may translate into a procedure for estimation by means of a, using the analogy principle. Specifically, if we replace the expectation with an average over our sample, or an average over i, we could simply define an estimator as the solution to the resulting empirical equation system. Now this idea of coming up with estimators is usually referred to as the method of moments. One issue that arises here is that when we look at this empirical system viewed as a function in this vector B, this average of these empirical, what we may think of as the empirical orthogonality conditions or the empirical moments may have no root. That is, it may not be possible to find any vector B that sets this function to zero. For this reason, we may instead entertain the following idea, which is to, instead of, in, which instead of aiming for an exact zero, we choose a vector B in order to minimize the distance between these empirical moments and the origin, zero. For this purpose, let W hat be an L by L positive definite symmetric positive definite matrix. That is, W hat can be interpreted as a weighting matrix. Now, this matrix may be possibly random, as we'll see in a moment. Taking such a weighting matrix as given, the generalized method of moments to est approach to estimation proceeds by defining an estimator as a minimizer of the following quadratic criterion function, where we've now taking, taken these empirical moments, these guys, and sandwiched them around the weighting matrix, which at, in this sense, or in this manner, we've aggregated up all of these moments 
to a scalar expression, which may or may not be close to zero, depending on our choice of B. So this defines our GMM estimator. Given the linearity of our system of equations, one may see that the GMM estimator actually has a closed form solution. For this purpose, let's introduce some matrix notation where ball phase Z, which we may think of as our grand instrument matrix, arises from stacking all of the instrument matrices, the ZIs, over, over N, over the individual index. Similarly, stack the difference outcomes and the difference regressors over I. Then we may write our GMM criterion function as the f using this quadratic form expression where we've only used matrix notation. And the GMM estimator minimizes is defined as a minimizer of this quadratic form. Given the positive definiteness of this matrix, one may show using multivariate calculus or inspection of the first order conditions or simply direct substitution that the GMM estimator is available in closed form and it has this somewhat lengthy but straightforwardly computable expression. Now, up to this point, we've treated the weighting matrix as something that was given to us. But in practice, if we want to implement the GMM estimator, we have to choose our weighting matrix. So that's what we'll discuss next. Now, one way to weight the moment conditions or empirical orthogonality conditions is to simply employ the identity matrix with dimension equal to the number of instruments. When employing the identity matrix as our weighting matrix, we're simply saying that we attach equal weight to each of the moment conditions or orthogonality conditions. Another method uses, takes the product of the grand instrument matrices and computes their inverse. By weighting the moment conditions inversely proportional to the product of the instruments, we're saying that we should attach less weight to noisy instruments. However, we choose to weight the various empirical orthogonality conditions, provided that our weighting matrices, which is a sequence, we should think of as a sequence indexed by n. So this here is as the cross-sectional dimension grows without bound, provided that our sequence of weighting matrices has a probability limit, let's call it W, which is a, and the, also that this probability limit is both non-random and symmetric positive definite, one may show that the GMM estimator using these, this sequence of weighting matrices is consistent for beta. In fact, the GMM estimator is, can be shown to be asymptotically normal, although with a possibly a somewhat hairy asymptotic variance expression. Now, inspection of the asymptotic variance reveals something interesting, namely that if we employ as our weighting matrices, our weighting matrix, the following matrix, which we may call W opt for optimal, then we get the smallest variance possible among all GMM estimators. In this sense, W opt or W optimal is an optimal weighting matrix. And what type of weighting weights are we employing? Well, we're using the inverse of the variance of the product of the instruments and the differenced idiosyncratic errors. Here, going back to our 
notation EI for this difference. If we employ this optimal weighting matrix, that is, we're using the best pos we're using a weighting matrix yielding the best, no, the smallest variance possible for the GMM type of estimators, then we arrive at an estimator which we may call or may think of as the optimal or optimally weighted GMM estimator. Here we'll denote this estimator as beta hat GMM with a superscript opt. And when we use this optimal weighting, one may express the asymptotic variance of this optimally weighted GMM estimator as the inverse of a sandwich formula up to the division by n. Now in the sandwich formula, we get the variance of the product of the instruments and differences in idiosyncratic error with an inverse. So this is our W opt appearing again. And it's sandwiched by this expected products of the different regressors and instruments on both sides. Now I want to stress that since I'm going over these calculations rather quickly, you should take that as an indicator that I'm not going to hold you accountable for any of these calculations. However, I do want to show you this formula for the asymptotic variance of the optimally weighted GMM estimator, since it'll be directly translatable to our asymptotic variance estimator a couple of slides from now. Now the alert student may have discovered at this point that there's an issue with our optimally weighted GMM estimator. Namely, since it hinges on this optimal weighting matrix, and the weighting matrix depends on these differenced idiosyncratic errors, it actually also depends on the vector parameters beta, which is unknown to us, right? These are the parameters that we're trying to estimate in the first place. Hence, this, this, the previously, the previously defined version of optimally weighted GMM is not actually feasible in practice. Now what we'll do next is that we will suggest a two-step procedure which circumvents this issue. So let's consider the following two-step procedure. Now in our first step, we'll estimate beta using as our weights, let's call it W check or something else than just W hat. We'll use this inverse product of the grand instrument matrices. Then our GMM estimator is available in closed form upon substituting W hat for this matrix. And it's given by this rather lengthy expression. At the end of our first step, we'll store all of the residuals arising from GMM. Let's call those EI check. Now, in our second step, we'll implement the GMM estimator using as our weighting matrix W hat, which is now given as an, which is now the estimator of the optimal weighting matrix upon replacing the expectation with an average over individual and replacing these differenced idiosyncratic errors with our residuals, our first step residuals. Hence, this W hat acts as an estimator of the optimal weighting matrix. Upon using this as our weighting matrix, we get an estimator, which we'll also refer to as beta hat GMM opt, since it is also optimal, at least in an asymptotic sense. Taking a closer look at the first step in our optimally weighted or our two-step procedure for obtaining the 
optimal GMM estimator or optimally weighted GMM estimator, we see that the first step is akin to two stage sleet squares when applied to our differenced equation system. That is, the right hand side here, our formula for the first step estimator, looks a lot like two stage sleet squares. Now, two stage sleet squares is here applied to not a single equation, but in fact an equation system. So, an apt name for this estimator is system two stage least squares or S2SLS. Now the first step estimator, which is the system two stage least squares estimator, yields a consistent but inefficient estimator. The purpose of the second step is to use an essentially optimal weighting matrix in order to obtain an efficient GMM estimator, at least in an asymptotic sense. Next we proceed to talking about how one may do various forms of inference. First, we're starting with how one may estimate the asymptotic variance. So recall here that the asymptotic variance of the optimally weighted GMM estimator takes the following form. Where we have to invert the whole thing and then divide by n. Again, the guy in the middle here is the optimal weighting matrix, just written out explicitly. Now, since we're dealing with, well, inside the inverse, we're dealing with a sandwich in these, this matrix, or this matrix and its transpose. And we already know how to estimate the meat of the sandwich by estimating the optimal weighting matrix. So the analogy principle suggests the following variance estimator. Where here I've replaced the expected product of the difference to xi with and uh, instruments. Whoops, this should be the matrix of difference regressors multiplied by the grand instrument matrix. And similarly, this should be the grand instrument matrix times the difference regressor matrix. And substituting an estimator for the optimal weighting matrix in here, upon canceling redundant ends, including this division by n, this is how our, our estimator of the asymptotic variance of the efficiently weighted GMM estimator arises. Now here, I write that we're using as our residual estimators or our estimator of the different idiosyncratic errors. We're using the residuals from the optimally weighted GMM estimator. Now one might be tempted to ask, should we use, is there a reason why we use the second stage residuals as opposed to the first stage? It's a very natural question to ask. Now one may show that it's actually asymptotically relevant which residuals we use, since both of these steps, the first and second steps, result in consistent estimators. On the other hand, the exact estimates that we get out of using this formula may depend on our choice of residuals. That is, it may matter in finite sample which residual estimators we use. This type of asymptotic variance estimator is consistent under the assumption of valid instruments 
or that the orthogonality, orthogonality conditions in fact hold and may therefore be fed into say or may therefore be used to obtain asymptotic standard errors or t statistics or it may be fed into say a walt test of linear hypothesis now another benefit of the gmm framework is that it also allows for a different type of test namely it under certain conditions allows us to test the validity of the instruments or the whether or not the orthogonality conditions in fact hold now we started out with having regressors or k regressors so and let so let k also denote the number of elements appearing in the difference regressors again if there are any time invariant regressors k should k here denotes the number of time varying regressors now there are l orthogonality conditions at our disposal corresponding to the number of columns in the grand instrument matrix if the number of orthogonality conditions is exactly equal to the number of elements in x or which also corresponds to the number of parameters to be estimated we say that we are in a case our case is a an example of exact identification on the other hand if we have more orthogonality conditions at our disposal then we may refer to this case as a case of over identification the reason being that we could have just extracted k of the l orthogonality conditions and use those for estimation and those would those would yield a consistent estimator alone provided that the orthogonality conditions are true now an idea here is that when we have when we're in the in the case of over identification then we have only used or roughly we've only used k of the orthogonality conditions for estimation purposes which le leaves us with k minus one degrees of freedom left for testing now the the uh, case of over identification therefore allows us to test the null hypothesis that our instruments are in fact valid instruments in the sense of this orthogonality condition holding Now for, next we'll construct a test of this null hypothesis which is also known as a test of over identification restrictions so let's stack the gmm residuals into a long vector a t minus one times n vector of residuals and let w hat opt denote some estimator of the optimal weighting matrix then the over identification test statistic j is given using this is given by this sandwich expression sandwich formula it is a quadratic expression a quadratic form in the regressors interacted with instruments as weighted by the optimal weights and then divided by the sample size one may show that under the null hypothesis that is when the instruments are in fact valid the over identification test statistic converges in distribution to a chi square random variable with l minus 1 degrees of freedom we can use this result to construct a testing procedure which states that one should reject the null that is one should reject the validity of the instruments at a significance level alpha if our over identification test statistic j exceeds the one minus alpha quantile of a chi square random variable with l minus k degrees of freedom the latter here the right hand side we can look up in a table for chi square random variates now the over identification test statistic j is also sometimes referred to as sergeant's j 
from its inventor, Dennis Sargent. So sometimes when you use estimation procedure or canned estimation routines for generalized method of moments, you may see as part of the output Sargent's J. Thus far, we've assumed that we have that all regressives are sequentially exogenous in our linear unobserved effects panel data model. Next, we'll discuss a slightly more general dynamic model and talk about various scenarios and how we would come up with an instrument matrix under these various scenarios. So our starting point is still a linear model. So this is our XIT beta where we have a lag dependent variable on the right hand side and also some regressors, say ZIT. Now, one may show that strict exogeneity of the regressors, the XITs, is still ruled out by the presence of the lag dependent variable. Also, since we're still allowing for this individual effect, we have to handle it using some sort of transformation. And here we'll calculate differences so as to eliminate the individual effect. By calculating difference, we end up with this equation system stated in the differenced variables. Now we already know that as instruments for this endogenous random variable, the difference lack dependent variable, we have the outcomes going at least two periods in the past. What about instruments for the difference additional regressors, this delta Z, ZIT? So how would we come up with instruments or what instruments are available for this these difference regressors? With the, the answer is somewhat annoyingly, it depends. It depends specifically on what we're willing to assume about these regressors specifically. If we're willing to assume that the CITs are strictly exogenous, then we could use the regressors ZI from all time periods, one, two, all the way through the, latter, the last one. That is, our instruments for the differenced regressors is given by ZI or in our previous notation, using this O notation, ZI capital T O. Again, one might find it funny to instrument a difference variable using levels, but one could also use differences, or in the simplest case, we could simply use the variable itself to instrument, or we could use the variable to instrument itself. Now, these options are available to us if the CITs are strictly exogenous. If they are only predetermined, that is, that they are sequentially exogenous, then we have to be more careful. But our previous discussion shows that at time t, as instruments for the difference regressors, the instruments that are available to us at time t are just the, the ZITs from the past. Again, running from 1, 2, but now up to lowercase t minus 1. Again, the subtraction by 1 here is due to us first calculating first differences. If the CITs are contemporaneously correlated with the idiosyncratic errors, then we run into trouble. Contemporaneous correlation, that is, the expected value of CIT and the, the expected value of the product of CIT and the idiosyncratic error in the same period is non-zero, explicitly rules out predeterminedness and therefore strict exogeneity. Also, contemporaneous correlation is not magically fixed through differencing, so it persists in the differences. Now, contemporaneous correlation may arise for various reasons, including both issues with omitted variables, simultaneity 
or measurement error, as discussed in detail in your previous econometrics course. For whatever the reason, when we're facing contemporaneous correlation, we need to find an external instrument. Where to look is, is somewhat is a somewhat difficult question, and the solution is case specific. As discussed, it may be we may be able to exploit the panel structure in such a manner which will suggest instruments, but in general we need to look outside the model. All of these issues are relevant for your problem set four, in which case we look at an empirical model for female labor force participation. So here the outcome Y is an indicator for whether individual I, a woman, works in time period T. Among the regressors are an indicator for whether the household has a kid, age two to, two to six, and whether woman I gives birth in this in year T, in the current year. One may be one may argue that both of these variables could be correlated with the individual effect, which leads us to calculate first differences so as to eliminate the individual effect. Moreover, one may also argue that fertility is contemporaneously endogenous and therefore requires an external instrument. More on that in the problem set. Now having kids age two to six is can it's too difficult to argue that having kids aged two to six is strictly exogenous since it is a result of previous fertility decisions. And as already argued, fertility, fertility decisions may be related to the idiosyncratic errors. However, it may be reasonable to assume that the kids variables are predetermined in which case we may use as instruments the in, an indicator for whether kids are in the household or kids aged two to six are in the household from past periods. Again, looking into the past upon first differencing. Before ending our sequence of lectures on the linear panel data model, I will try to summarize the various lectures. Now, if not for anything else, a grand takeaway from this sequence of lectures is that the appropriate, whether an estimation method is appropriate or not, depends on the assumptions that we're willing to make. If we're willing to make very strong assumptions, such as the strict exogeneity assumption holding, and also that the individual effect is uncorrelated with regressors, then a random effects approach to estimation is appropriate and this type of estimation method exploits both within I variation over time and variation between different individuals. For this reason, a random effects approach allows us to estimate coefficients attached to variables which are time invariant. On the other hand, if we don't believe the individual effect to be uncorrelated with the regressors, then we should do some sort of transformation so as to eliminate it. If we still believe in strict exogeneity, then a fixed effects or first difference approach is appropriate. These, appropriate, these methods exploit only within I variation and therefore cannot be used to estimate coefficients on time invariant variables. Now, given our assumption of strict exogeneity, the choice between the two methods fixed effects and first differences, it's just a matter of efficiency. Now, if we still not believing in the individual effect and regressors being uncorrelated, if our strict exogeneity is cast into doubt, we have to be more careful. However, if we're willing to assume that while the regressors are not strictly exogenous, they are sequentially exogenous, then our panel data structure provides us a method, provides us with a method for coming up with instrumental variables. Hence, under sequential exogeneity, 
upon differencing, instrumental variable or more generally GMM types of estimators are appropriate. Our general approach here has been to first difference the equation or equation system of interest and then use lagged levels or perhaps differences of the right hand side variables as instruments. In the scenario where a regressor cannot even be argued to be contemporaneously exogenous, we have to search for an external instrument. We typically have to go outside the model in order to find an instrument. Now the goal here is to find a variable which can be credibly argued to be uncorrelated with the composite error. In any case, the solution here is case specific. That ends our lectures or our sequence of lectures on the linear unobserved, unobserved effects model for panel data. Next, we'll discuss estimation methods which are appropriate for nonlinear models.